to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on topics ranging from Jewish history and the Bible to Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. To find out about David's talks, books, and more, visit davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. I call this talk Revelation in Exile. Uh, and that is what I'm hoping to try to explain how this happened, because in a range of places around the world, the known world, or cult, entire cultures were undergoing thought and religious and spiritual transformations. Whether we are talking about, you know, this is the golden age of Greek philosophy. We're not quite at Socrates yet, but Parmenides and all this idea to unify reality in Greek philosophy... It's also round about the time that we estimate Zarathustra. It's also, as we know, if you go as far as India, this is the time of the Buddha. If you go even further into China, it's the time of Confucius. The whole world is undergoing transformations of thought. But not us. Because we have already gone through our transformation of thought, which happens a couple of hundred years before with the rise of the prophets of Israel who transformed our understanding of God, our understanding of the nation of Israel, its role in the world. Remember that what I'm going to to talk about tonight is actually not 500, it's just prior. It's, if if I was to divide this... Mi- minus 600, minus 700. So really we're talking, uh, the prophet Ezekiel's career really is around here, around the minus 600 and beyond. In fact, as we're going to see, it's going to start in around the year 592, his prophetic career. We're going to talk about that prior to that. And it's going to go up till about five minus 570. What I'm going to do now, I'm not going to stick with the timeline. This is not a lesson in chronology. You don't have to memorize it. I'm just going to use the timeline as a hook uh, to explain what I'm talking about so we don't get confused. And this timeline is going to be a huge zoom in. It's going to be a big zoom in. I'm going to call this minus 500. This is minus 600. And this is minus 700. Probably don't even need this part, but just so we understand where we are. During much of the 7th century BCE, this period here, and what I'm saying now is historical background to the book of Ezekiel. If you really, really want to understand the historical background to the book of Yechezkel, and obviously we don't have too much time to go into that tonight, is you really need to understand the book of Yerumyahu. The book of Jeremiah is the parallel and contemporary account to Ezekiel. And I'll touch more on that when we get to those points. Of course, you do. You would be aware, just as a footnote, you would be aware that we almost came very close. We came very close to knowing nothing about the book of Ezekiel. The book of Yechezkel is a book that is steeped in controversy and was very much at the heart of the controversy over the canon of the Bible itself, over Tanakh, that took place during the Mishnaic period, that's during the Tanaitic period, round about this big discussion on what books should be and should not be in the Tanakh, raged for a number of decades, from the end of the first century until round about the middle of the second. And Ezekiel, no book was disputed more than Yechezkel. And there are at least three reasons why the book of Yechezkel, and I'm talking about the book now, why the book of Yechezkel aroused so much controversy and why so many spiritual leaders wanted to have the book hidden and not included in the canon, as we'll see. The number one, it raises some very big and speculative ideas about God, about, in a sense, in a nutshell, to put it crudely, what God looks like. And we know that God doesn't look like anything. But, as we're going to see in the book of Ezekiel, there are descriptions of the divine realm that the rabbis, were con- of the Mishnah, was concerned would cause people to err about the conception of God. Second reason that it came under huge dispute was because s- some of the 
analogies and some of the descriptions used in the book of Ezekiel are highly explicit and to put it bluntly appropriate only for adult audiences as especially chapter 16 and chapter 23 as we will see the prophet did not hold back in his descriptions of the nation and what they were up to and the third, probably even possibly the most significant reason why it troubled the rabbis of the Mishnah was because <laughs> there's a lot of things in the book of Ezekiel that don't seem to be consistent with what we understand from the Torah, to put it mildly. Especially when it comes to Ezekiel's vision of the future temple and so on that we will look at. There were huge discrepancies in the temple service between what the Torah told us should be happening and what the prophet Ezekiel says should be happening. And it wasn't until a particular rabbi, of Hananiah ben Cheskia, went up to an attic with 300 barrels of oil, the Talmud tells us, and sat down and reconciled all the inconsistencies in the book of Ezekiel so that it would be acceptable to be included in the Bible itself. We don't have much left of that project, of that exegetical project, but we do know that it was certainly accepted and it's good that it was because it is a fundamental text to our understanding of the role of the Jewish people in the world and there's no question that that is why the rabbis included it. So that's the text itself. I just want to say that it's very controversial but if you really want to understand its historical background you look at the book of Jeremiah, you look at the end of the books of Kings and you also, we can also have our information about Ezekiel backed up by a great range of cultural, historical and anthropological sources that we might have time to touch upon. Basically, during the 7th century, as you know, it's the land of Israel, back here in minus 720, the land of Israel had been split into two kingdoms and the northern kingdom underwent a total ethnic cleansing by the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire that of course is the Mediterranean. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go there. <laughs> Those of you who are confused, that's the water. That's Spain, Italy, Greece, Egypt, North Africa and here is the land of Israel. I'm, do, I'm spending a minute on this because it's going to be very useful for us to understand. That's the land of Israel. And Assyria is over here in what is today northern Iraq. And for a long time, Assyria had been a dominant force in this whole area. In fact, they were pretty much the first of the great global empire, not, obviously not global in a total sense, but expansive, conquering, non-stopping empires that leapt onto the stage of history during this period. While they were busy being the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and uh, first of all leaders like Tiglat Pileser, and then eventually at their height, emperors like Ashurbanipal and so on, while they were busy doing all that, and when I say these names, these names of As Neo-Assyrian emperors, they're not just, you know, I'm not just saying them to sound clever. These people were real and these people are huge figures in history. We know a lot about this period. How do we know a lot, for example, about the reign of Ashurbanipal, the emperor of Syria, is because we have his entire library in 30,000 cuneiform tablets that was one of the great discoveries of 19th century British archaeology. And it's all housed. In the, I mean, we know about this period massively. And they, the whole time that they were being the Nero Syrian Empire, there was this place to the south that had held a long-standing and complex relationship with Assyria that was sort of a very close religiously and politically part of the Assyrian Empire, but nevertheless held on to its own identity. It was a little bit like, perhaps a little bit like Scotland to England or something like that. They were part of the greater, and they knew they were an important part of it, but they were held on to their identity, and that was a place called Babel, Babylon. It's run by the Chaldeans and so on. It's quite complex, but eventually they rose up as a force within the Assyrian Empire 
and basically eventually conquered it. Now, that didn't happen until here. But for most of the 700s, we are existing in the aftermath of the Neo-Assyrian ethnic cleansing of the Northern Kingdom and we are Judah. We are the nation of Judah. The capital city is Jerusalem. And for most of this century, there are some horrendous kings in Judah who are pursuing a type of polytheistic religious syncretism coupled with immense and unstoppable corruption and violence and tyranny. It was not nice. And eventually, round about here, however, we had a massive reforming king. I'm only going over this quickly because this is just the background to Ezekiel. Here sits Josiah. And the Josianic revolution was a religious, a zealot religious revolution that wiped away all of the foreign cults. It established the book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Dvarim, as the central constitution of the nation. It went back to worship of God and the national religion and structures of the temple and of the nation. But Josiah overplayed his hand in international politics. And when the Neo-Assyrian Empire was collapsing, and Egypt started moving in to fill the vacuum before Babylon could conquer the Middle East, Josiah decided that he would stand in the way of an Egyptian advance and was killed in battle at Megiddo in minus 609. And that was a very, very fateful moment. It is at that time then that Josiah's son, Jehoahaz, comes to the throne. But Pharaoh of Egypt, at that time, it's, we're in the 26th dynasty, or late 25th, about 26th dynasty, Nahor comes through, and which, which is obviously called, those of you who study Egyptology know that the 26th dynasty is regarded as the late, late period. He comes, and he takes Jehoahaz, after only three months on the throne, the son of Josiah, the son of Yoshiahu, and he exiles him to Egypt. Basically just him, and Jehoahaz dies there shortly thereafter. This was a mini shock, still a shock, that a king of Judah was exiled by an invading army, but it all sort of happened pretty quickly within the shadow of Josiah's death. Then came to the throne a brother of Jehoahaz, you don't have to remember all these names, you're not going to be quizzed on them, it's okay, I'm just flowing through, called Jeho Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. We're still not at the book of Ezekiel yet, but it's important to understand. Jehoiakim's reign is here, and it's about 10 years. Jehoiakim. That is the big king in most of the book of Jeremiah. And Jehoiakim rules for about 10 or 11 years during which time he has a very complex relationship with the political powers around him and eventually he rebels against his Babylonian overlords and Nebuchadnezzar, Nabuchadur Yusur, the crown prince of Babylon whose father Nabopolassar had re-established the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Nabuchadur Yusur comes now having crushed the Neo-Assyrian, he's now the dude, he rules the Middle East, he's not going to have these little archiparchim in Judah rebelling against him. And in 597, minus 597, he comes to Jerusalem, and as he arrives, now there are many different versions historically of this, don't forget that <laughs> we... The, 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 these are not abstract things. The archaeological, physical archaeological evidence for all these events is overwhelming. They have, just in recent years, uncovered the foundations and even more, because I've actually stood there, of Jehoiakim's palace. So we actually know the very wall I'm about to talk about, because it leans out over the palace and down into the valley of Kidron below, just opposite Silwan. 
and they lowered him down over the wall, which was basically what you did if you were under siege and your king had rebelled. There's only one way to really save yourselves, and that's lower the king over the wall. And we're not sure if he was dead before or after they threw him over the wall, but he was certainly dead by the time he got to the bottom. And Nebuchadnezzar places Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin. Well, it's not that simple, not that simple. Because Jehoiakim actually reigned for three months. So there are views that say that Jehoiakim died earlier and by the time Nebuchadnezzar came, Jehoiakim had already been on the throne for three months. We're not entirely sure. What we do know is this. Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem in 597, didn't destroy the temple, didn't destroy Jerusalem. He simply plundered the temple, not simply, but extensively, plundered the temple and took the king, his family and several thousand people who represented basically the ruling class of Judea into exile. He took them back to Babel. And that king, who only sat for three months, was Yechonia. After which, Yechonia's uncle, the last remaining son of Josiah, Sidkiyahu, known in English as Zedekiah, came to the throne and ruled for about ten years before it all ended, as we'll see. In this exile of 597, amongst the exiles of 597, were some very unique people. Because they took the cream of society. They took the scholars, the sages, the teachers, anyone who basically knew anything. And the only people who were left were sort of the nebuchs. I mean, you read the... Yes, exactly. It is a bit like that. You read the book of Yeremiah, you read the book of Sefer Malachim, you'll see it's a bit nebbish what's going on back there because the whole cream of society was taken into exile. And that included some very, very talented young people, including a young priest, a Kohen, whose name was Yechezkel Ben Buzi. Now, we don't know exactly how old Yechezkel ben Buzi was. Some say he may have been around 25 years old. But we do suspect strongly, from the book of Ezekiel, that he must have been a functioning priest already in the temple by the time he was exiled. But, you know, I want you to place yourself in the position of this priest. Now, for most of Judea, in fact, for all of Judea, this was a shattering event. It was so great, in fact, that many people thought that this was the actual fulfilment of the warnings of doom about exile that had been received by the prophets for some decades now. And the whole of the political scene in Jerusalem was divided into two factions. One very big, large faction, the majority, were saying, and this wasn't just the case in Jerusalem, it was also the case amongst the exiles themselves, that this situation was highly temporary. That in fact, in a couple of years' time, Yechonia will come back. Babel will be defeated, Yechonia will come back with all the temple vessels, and it's all going to be really, really good. It's not the only time, it is not the only time that we have heard in Jewish history that Mashiach is coming back. But in fact... Yechonia didn't come back. Yechonia was in prison. And all the exiles that were around him were living in Babel, in a number of settlements between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Babel, remember, although it was exile, it was a pretty nice exile. If you had to be in exile, you were at the center of an expanding and dynamic empire. I have a suspicion, and I don't want this mentioned outside this room, but I have a suspicion. It's not in the book, but it's a... Uh, it's a thought after reading Sefer Yechezkel many times that it could be that Yechezkel the prophet hadn't really felt the impact of this event. He's a young priest. 
going into exile with his king, where the king, by the way, was allocated rations by the ruling empire. They weren't tortured, they weren't put to death. Zedekiah will eventually suffer greatly. But in this exile of 597, it was actually done with some accord of dignity and respect, and several thousand Judeans were taken off into Babel. And maybe these young Kohanim thought, that's rather exciting. Especially since we might be back in a couple of years' time, and we'll be the heroes, because we went into exile. It's all very exciting. Maybe. But we're just about now ready to open the book of Yechezkel. Because the book of Yechezkel begins with the words, in the 30th year, in the 5th year of the exile of Jehoiachin. So we know exactly when the book of Ezekiel opens. It opens in the year 592. Which is the 5th year of the exile of Jehoiachin. And that's what he tells you at the very beginning. And why does it say in the 30th year? What is the meaning of the 30th year? So there are a lot of attempts to try and explain what the 30th year means. Anyone know what the 30th year means? Anyone want to attempt? Well, interestingly enough, that is a view. It's probably, it's probably unlikely because no one else in the Bible speaks like that. But... Definitely, there's a number of scholars that said, well, wait a minute, that, you remember I said he might have been 25? It's based on that view. But in fact, most people regard, that, and we're not sure, but the 30th year is probably, if you go back 30 years, you're around about the year 622, minus 622, 623, which was a Yovel. It was a Jubilee year. And they counted according to the Jubilee years. It also happens to be the year, those of you who understand the career of Josiah and have studied that, the year that they found the Sefer Torah, they found the Torah inside the temple, which was in the Jubilee year. It really marked the height of the Josianic revolution, marked a whole new phase of Am Yisrael. And therefore, it's probably, it's probably, by the way, um, when is the next Yovel? When is the next Jubilee year? So the last Jubilee year was 1980-81. So we're actually right now in the 30th year, or we just finished the 30th year, in the 31st year of this next Yovel. The next Yovel is actually the year 577, so sorry, 5790, which I think is 2028. We're not going there now, or, or rather, we're not going there now. We're not going there now. Okay, because then these discussions about do you count it from the first year or the 50th year, the 49th year. So, this prophet, this young prophet, who's so far been in exile for five years and just wondering what's happening, meanwhile debates rage around him. He's standing on the banks of the river Kvar. The Kvar is a tributary of the Tigris, and he is standing there. <laughs> I said I would do this in an hour, and after half an hour, I haven't even started the book. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. There are 48 chapters, and we're going to get through them in the next 30 minutes. But it's very, very important to understand when Ezekiel is talking. This young priest is standing by the banks of the river, and he sees, he sees something, a cloud, some sort of apparition coming towards him and in fact as it gets closer and more in focus he realizes that he is seeing the divine chariot this is a monumental moment because number one the prophet if he's to become a prophet needs to be communicated with directly by God and yet this prophet is not in the land of Israel where all other prophecies of Tanakh originate. He's in exile. I mean, they had no clue when they went into exile. They didn't even know what they were supposed to be doing. There was no temple in Babylon. 
that they could worship at. No one had invented shuls. There were no, you know, Jewish community centres that you could come and play, you know, bingo on a Tuesday. There was nothing. They didn't even know what they were supposed to do. But they did know the meaning of a prophet. And so the fact that God is revealed in exile, they didn't even know if God was able to hear them from Babylon. Now, it's not the only vision of the divine chariot in Tanakh. There's a very famous one, of course, in the sixth chapter of the book of Yeshayahu, in the book of Isaiah. But the very big difference there is that Isaiah's vision is more or less static. Ezekiel's vision is moving. It's dynamic. And it's awesome. It's an entire chapter. It's nearly 30 psukim. And the details are almost impossible for the human mind to comprehend. There are flesh... Remember... One of the reasons why Chazal, one of the reasons why the sages wanted to bury the book of Ezekiel is because they regarded it as spiritually and physically dangerous. There are stories told from in the Talmud and from Jewish history of people that have been physically harmed by spending too much time studying that first chapter of the book of Ezekiel which describes the divine chariot. When Eliezer ben Yehuda the guy who re sort of ignited spoken Hebrew at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century for our generation, was looking for a word for electricity. He went for the word chashmal, and the word chashmal is a word he took from the first chapter of Ezekiel because all of the great scholars and commentators of Jewish history have said, we don't know what that word means. And Eliezer Ben Yehuda said, perfect, I'll use that for electricity. But in fact, there is another reason he used it, is because the traditions associated with the comprehension of that word, I mean, sometimes you'll see it translated as electrum. It was a type of flashing color energy that surrounded the divine chariot. And there's a famous story in the Talmud about a young child that was studying the first chapter of Ezekiel and suddenly apprehended what Hashmal was and some sort of energy came out of the page and zapped him, literally electrocuted him and he died. Which is why the rabbis didn't want people reading that. And in the Mishnah you'll see all sorts of laws about how you can teach it and who you can say it in front of. All of which, of course, forbids me from going further into it right now because I don't want anyone here to get zapped. (laughs) But it's a very big vision. Wheels within wheels and chariots and... And then, of course, he only has a few seconds to look at it because he falls flat on his face and then a voice emerges from the... This is where we're already now in chapter 2. A voice emerges from the divine chariot. It's, It's a huge chapter, number one. It's a huge chapter. The whole of the subsequent story of Jewish mysticism, the foundations of the Kabbalah, are built on that chapter. That is Ma'aseh Merkava. That is the workings of the chariot. Which, for those mystics that have delved into it, is a description of the cosmos and how it works. Spiritually and in many other levels. It's a massively foundational text of Jewish mysticism. But by chapter 2, he's already flat on his face and he's hearing a voice from the chariot telling him that he's being made a prophet. And not just any sort of prophet, he's told that he's being made a tsofe, which means a lookout. And he is a lookout because he's told by God, I need someone to tell the people what's actually going to happen. If they listen, good. If they don't, well, you at least will have done your job. That's the function of a lookout. If you don't say what I tell you to say, then everybody's blood will be on your head. But if you say what I tell you to say, then each person can decide for himself, and you at least will be blameless. And he is told that the Jewish people need to understand that it is not the case that there is going to be a restoration of the current situation. Yuchonya is not going to come back. The Babylonians are not going to go away. In fact, 
it's going to be very, very bad. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And the temple itself, that very building that you claim was inviolate and cannot be destroyed, will be burnt to the ground. And I'll tell you, says God to Ezekiel, you know who's at the head of the Babylonian army? I am, says God. Well, now, Ezekiel is told to go through various performance pieces. And this is one of the unique things about the career of Ezekiel. He was not simply a mouthpiece. He actually had to go through some pretty full-on experiences to demonstrate. And he was told by God, they will not listen to you. They will come and see you talk because you're going to be very entertaining. And people will flock to you and they'll come and see you talk. But they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to take you seriously until it happens. Then they will know, says Hashem, that there was a prophet in their midst. But until then, you're going to have to put up with whatever they say. They're not going to believe you. He has to build a little model of Jerusalem on a clay tablet. And he has to put up like a siege, like a toy siege, like a, a, a model siege around it. And he has to lie on his side next to it for 390 days on his left side and 40 days on his right side. He has to make cakes and eat them. And these cakes have to be baked on a poo barbecue. He has to cook them directly on human excrement. Ezekiel actually, to, to indicate, you know, just what, what were the abominations that the people of Israel are the defilement by being in exile. He actually complains about that. He says, God, look, I'm a priest. I've always eaten nice things. I've never really, you know, I really, really, really look, I've done all the other stuff you asked me to do, but I've, I really can't eat food cooked direct on human excrement. And God says, okay, you can use animal excrement. <laughs> it's there in, in, in chapter four, if you want to look at it. And so on. And some very, 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 very harsh admonitions follow in the next few chapters on the nature of the sin and just the level of abominations that the people of, e of Judah had descended to. And I'm going to spend just a minute because I want you to realize what sort of a society it had become. There were, of course, various, um, as I said, uh, polytheistic syncretisms going on. People had made of Jerusalem, the leaders of Jerusalem had made of the temple and the temple mount and Jerusalem a sort of religious center for everybody. But you don't get idol worship without social injustice. And we're starting to understand now through a great range of studies some of the levels of depravity that were going on at the time in the late Judean kingdom. Parents were sacrificing their firstborn children. You had the firstborn girl or the firstborn boy you would bring into the temple and they would be passed through fire and they would be sacrificed. And so you say to yourself, those who've studied anthropology will know that these questions are always being asked about bizarre cultures like that. How do you get people to do that? Like that's a level that we're, what, 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 what brings a, a culture, a society to do that sort of thing? And then you start to delve deeper and you realize that the entire structure of the priests and of the syncretic religions that were going on were based on the fact that fathers would bring their children and sacrifice them at the temple in return for an afternoon of sexual delight with the temple prostitutes. All of which was designed to maintain the corrupt structure of the priests themselves. And all of this was encouraged by the leadership. It was a highly depraved situation. God said, it is that situation that is going to cause me to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. But we're showing this in graphic detail. Because in chapter 8... There's a fantastic, I think chapters 8 to 10 of the book of Ezekiel, everybody's familiar 
Everybody's familiar with the big ideas from Ezekiel. You know, the, the, the chapter 1, the Merkava, the chariot. They all, everybody knows chapter 37 that we'll talk about soon. The, the valley of the dry bones, the resurrection. Everybody's heard of Gog or Magog in chapters 38 and 39. But chapters 8 to 10 are not just one of the great pivotal moments in world literature. They're also an incredibly important moment in the history of the Jewish people and the history of the spiritual unfolding in the world. And also, it's just fantastic science fiction. Ezekiel, standing in Babylon, he's actually, he's actually after he had this big initial revelation from God who was born to prophet, he actually ha- went and spent time in a city called Tel Aviv, interestingly enough. And he is sitting there, and he's over the various uh, next couple of years, he's giving different prophecies, doing these performance pieces and so on. He's sitting at home, it would seem, and he's got some of the elders of the community, of the exilic community in front of him. Because although they're not taking him seriously, they're very entertained. And they're sitting in front of him. And suddenly, he sees, the hand of God comes upon him, and he sees someone in front of him who is like this flashing bronze figure, who takes him, it says by Betzitzit Roshi, we're not entirely sure what that means, but it probably means by his pious, And he drags him, astrally travelling with him, a wind travelling at supersonic speeds, and takes him, boom, and puts him in the temple. And he said, and as they pass around the temple, they see out the front gate of the temple. So so obviously there are big discussions in in scholarly literature uh, and in commentary about was this like a real astral travel or was this something he envisioned? Was he actually there? You know. But he's there and he is shown this, we don't even know what it was. Semalaki Naha Makne, the symbol of jealousy that provokes jealousy. I'm not even sure how to translate this, but it's some abomination, possibly an Asherah sitting at the front of the temple. And then he's taken around. And he says, oh, you're going to see worse than this, God tells him. Takes him round the temple and he goes, there's a little hole in the wall. Look through the hole in the wall. He looks through the hole in the wall. And inside this dark, mysterious chamber, he sees all sorts of disgusting abominations inscribed on the walls. And inside the room, he sees the entire Sanhedrin, the Shivim Mizikne Israel, the 70 elders of Israel, inside this dark room, offering incense and other votive offerings and prayers to all these idols of abominations on the walls. And God says, look what they're doing because they are saying God cannot see us. And he says, oh, but you're going to see worse than this. He takes him around to the other side of the temple in this massive astral vision and he sees a group of women weeping for Tammuz. And Tammuz was the ancient world, one of the ancient world manifestations of the ancient world god of vegetation. It's probably they're worshipping some sort of Akkadian, Phoenician, Ugaritic synthesis of the concept of Tammuz. And whereas we associate the death of vegetation with winter, remember you're in Babylon, so it's summer. They would mourn for 60 days as Tammuz, the god of vegetation, these hot winds would come. And when is Tammuz? It's in the middle of the northern summer. And they would dry up all the death. Vegetation It was a time of death and mourning. Until as, as Tammuz, the god, went into the underworld before he would emerge. Huge cult, the cult of Tammuz. So these women weeping for Tammuz. And then he took, oh, you're going to see worse than this, God says to us. He takes him on the other side of the temple, and there on the other side of the temple are a group of around 25 men with their backs to the temple, worshipping, bowing down and worshipping the rising sun. Shamash. Very, very interesting. Fascinating. Two entirely opposite nature religions. One where, which mourns the sun's arrival, and one which actually worships the sun. And we know it's very interesting because that ritual is taken directly 
well, in my opinion, but certainly there's a massive parallel between that and those of you who've read the Enuma Elish, the Battle of Gilgamesh. And in fact, that's exactly what Gilgamesh and his mates were doing every morning. They were worshipping the rising sun. It's taken almost directly. You know, the Enuma Elish was part of the Babylonian <coughs> New Year ceremony. It's a, it's, it's, if you want to understand idolatry, you read the book of Ezekiel. And then suddenly... <laughs> He's transported. Oh, no, he's not transported back because the big moment is yet to come. This is just chapter 8 and 9. And then in chapter 10, God, in the form of the divine chariot, whose cloud, whose cloud of glory fills the Holy of Holies, departs the temple in this massive description that's bewildering but leaves you just Amazed. The Kruvim, the cherubs that sat on top of the ark, raised their wings and spiritually lift up to join the chariot as it moves from the Holy of Holies to the main court and then to outside the temple and then moves over to the Mount of Olives as it leaves the temple. And as it leaves, an angel reaches down and takes fiery coals from underneath the divine chariot and throws them on Jerusalem, and it burns. And then, whoosh, he's taken back to Babel. So, I mean, I urge you to read that. It is a mind-blowing astral travel that is a pivotal moment. The Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, leaving the Temple, leaving Jerusalem. Now, go and tell them about what you've seen, says God. So, a few more years pass. And Ezekiel, who's been told to go and take implements of exile... Implements of exile, you know, a flask, a cup, a sack, a towel, and wander around. I have to spend just two seconds on chapter 16. Chapter 16 is, together with chapter 23, is one of the X-rated sections that I alluded to before. Uh, but some of the psukim are familiar to us from the Haggadah and so on. Uh, Israel is compared to a baby that is abandoned on a hill. God comes across the baby who hasn't even been given the most basic primary care, washes the baby, looks after it, grows it. It's a girl. And eventually enters into a covenant of solemn marriage. Problem is, this young woman, you trusted in your beauty, and she becomes this uncontrollable, frenzied nymphomaniac that goes round having relations with every single person she can find. Obviously, the metaphor of this harlot is that that is the nation of Israel itself, who has, in a sense, metaphorically, fornicated with every other foreign ideology it comes across. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, all of the different gods and cults, but all I asked you, all I asked you, says God, was just to obey the simple commandments that I have given you to be in this land. Because there is a huge relationship, and I, I, I keep talking about this when it's trying to, I'm trying to refine it in my mind as a way of expressing this effectively. But there's a huge relationship between the, the idol worship, which always involves the pursuit of power and social injustice. What do idols want from you? What do cults want from you? They want, they say, worship me, says the idol, and I will give you power. I will give you success. I will give you rain. I will give you harvest. I will give you money. But the mode of worship of the God of Israel is simply to act and live with justice and righteousness. That is the mode of worship of the God of Israel. That is how the God of Israel wants to be expressed. And in fact, if anything, the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel are really a theory about powerlessness. It's very close to our generation today because many, many people, because, because of the fact that we have, for example, the state of Israel, and many people would be, and God forbid it should never happen, but many people would not be able to envisage what that would be like if that started to deconstruct and come apart, and was actually under threat of no longer being. This is what Ezekiel is trying to communicate to the people. 
And in chapter 18, he reaches a massive idea. In chapter 18 of the book of Ezekiel, he discusses what is the foundational idea of all the prophets, and that is the idea of Teshuvah. The idea of Teshuvah, Teshuvah does not mean repentance. It's sometimes translated as repentance, and I suppose that's one way of translating it. But Teshuvah means response, return. Returning to God. And the big idea that comes out of Ezekiel in relation to Teshuvah, he's not the first prophet to talk about Teshuvah. But he does say that Teshuvah is an entirely dependent upon you. Your reward and punishment, whether you are righteous or wicked, depends upon you. You are not punished for the sins of others, and others are not responsible for your sins. But even more importantly, it is about now. You cannot say, I have been righteous all my life, but the last five minutes I sinned. I'm sorry. You are judged how you are now. Similarly, if you've been wicked all your life, and you became righteous five minutes ago, you are judged how you are now. Teshuvah and this dynamic relationship with God is, a, is an idea, idea of now. It is, are you going to make that transformation? And amazingly, Ezekiel realizes this on an individual level from his understanding of the nation as a whole. Because even now, at this unbelievably late stage, it is possible. Lo echbots, says God, I don't want people to die. I don't want the wicked to die. That is not the idea. Ella b'shuvo midrachav I want people to return from their evil ways and live. Throw your sins off you. Why should you die? The big ideas coming out of chapter 18 of the book of Ezekiel. Foundational ideas for understanding of the concept of Teshuvah. Understanding of the concept of how we can, in a second, transform our relationship with God and with reality. And all it takes is not, do I bring another sacrifice? Sacrifice is only the outer manifestation of Teshuvah. It is, in fact, how am I relating to other people? And then he goes on this historical overview. He goes right through the whole history of the Jewish people, chapters 19, 20, and then eventually in 23, is a big, uh, big, once again, these two sisters, one representing the northern kingdom, one the southern kingdom, and once again, the very, very, very explicit <laughs> uh, descriptions of these two sisters who are harlots. Literally, you opened your legs to everybody that went by. If you find that shocking, people were shocked by the book of Ezekiel. But he's telling it how it is. And then in chapter 24, we now know where we are now. Because now, it's four years since his original revelation. We're now in the year 588. And the reason we know that we're in 588 is because we know the exact date on which chapter 24 of Ezekiel was delivered to Ezekiel. And it was the 10th of Tevet. What happened on the 10th of Tevet in the year minus 588? Well, you see, just a couple of years prior to that, Zedekiah, Tidkiyahu, smart chap that he was, decided to call a bit of a conference of all his king mates and said, look, you know, Babylon, maybe not as strong as we think. Might be time if we all bind together. We might actually be able to affect a rebellion here, get our independence tries to bring in a bit of Egypt, a bit of the other nations around. And of course, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar is having none of it. He comes with a massive army and he arrives and begins the siege of Jerusalem on the 10th of Tevet, 588 BCE. The 10th of Tevet is a fast day till today, till our times. This was the uh, other things happened on the 10th of Tevet, but this was the original 10th of Tevet. But Ezekiel is not in Jerusalem. Ezekiel hears about this on the very night that it happened through divine communication. And God says to Ezekiel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's army has arrived at Jerusalem. And the siege has begun. And you're going to have to tell people about it. And when you wake up in the morning, your wife will be dead. The prophet has to go through. But you're not going to be allowed to mourn. 
And when people see this, that your wife is dead and you know, you're going about your business like normal, and you're dressing like normal, you're not showing any signs of mourning, it's going to look so strange and people are going to go, why are you so numb to your wife's death? And you're going to say to them, because you will experience the same numbness when you hear about the destruction of Jerusalem. And they're going, ah, you're an idiot. But of course, two years later, one and a half years later, in 586, Nebuchadnezzar's army, of course, destroys the temple itself. Chapters 25 to 32 of the book of Ezekiel seem to be a sort of interlude. They are prophecies against other nations. One on Ammon and uh, about two or three on, on Sur, Tyre, which is Phoenicia in the north, and three or four on Egypt. But by the time we come back to chapter 33, a refugee has arrived from Jerusalem. And he's so haggard and exhausted, he's run all the way there to the exilic, exilic community in Babylon. And all he has the strength to say to Ezekiel is two words. Hukta'ha'ir, the city has been destroyed. And that is when people realized that everything that Ezekiel had been saying came from God and was true. All of the ideas of Teshuvah in chapter 33 are reinforced again and again. I know that we're getting now at the hour. Allow me, um, I've, I've, the, the, the really big parts of Ezekiel are coming up, but I will spend, I'll have to spend two minutes more on that. A question. Uh, yes, that, that, that psalm, Psalm 137, although we sat by the rivers of Babylon and we wept and we remembered Zion, probably from a little later in the piece. But yeah. Now the exilic community is shattered. Now it's bewildered. Now it needs something else. It needs phenomenal messages of restoration and comfort. But before he does that, and that is why, I mean, if we looked at the structure of the book, chapters 1 to 24 really are leading up to the Khurban, the destruction. Say 25 to 32 deal with, uh, with uh, prophecies uh, against, uh, about the nations, various nations, and then from 33 until the end of the book is really one massive vision of the restoration, the great restoration of Israel. But in chapter 34, before he actually starts that, he has someone that he, need, that he needs to give a very, very big musr to. He needs to give a very big chastisement to one section of the population that have so far, to a point, escaped his direct attention. And that, of course, is the leadership of the Jewish people. What he calls the Ro'e Israel, the shepherds of Israel. He said, your job was to guide these people, to look after them, to care for them. Instead, you have raped them and you have slaughtered them. And you have drunk their blood and you have become fat on them. But I am going to create a new type of shepherd says the prophet. I'm going to create a new type of leadership. This by now, Yechezkel is a totally different type of prophet because he's not a young priest who's doing some funny performance pieces that people don't take seriously. Now they know who he is. Now they know he's more mature, but they now know that he is the serious prophet that all of these years has been communicating the true word of God. And that is why chapter 36 is so pivotal. And I only, obviously, because of the time, I only have a minute to spend on these chapters. I hope that if you haven't read the book of Ezekiel, or if you're going to reread it, you'll go home and have a look at these chapters, because they are mind-blowing. Let's talk about exile, says the prophet. Now, we know we're in exile. We know we're here for real. And we have a letter from the prophet Yeremiah in Jerusalem, who tells us that he has been communicated to by God, and that we should settle down. Let's get some jobs, let's get our kids into good schools, because we know we're going to be here for a while. As it turns out, it's going to be 70 years. But, we're now in exile. The temple is destroyed. 
What is exile? Says the prophet Ezekiel. What is it? What actually is it? Is it a physical place? Is it a state of mind? And I'll tell you what it is in chapter 36 of Sefer Yechezkel. It's, it's, it's full on. It's not easy to read. Especially when you read it carefully. But I'll tell you what exile is, says the prophet. Exile is a chilul Hashem. It is a desecration of the name of God. Nothing more, nothing less. Your very existence outside the land of Israel, from where you were expelled and exiled, simply because of what you are and what you did, is a desecration of God's name. Of course the nations are going to say that their gods are greater than the God of Israel because you have been exiled. And so long as you're, you're exiled for a purpose. But that's not how the nations will see it. And in fact, says the prophet, says God through the prophet in chapter 36 of Sefer Yechezkel, even if you don't ultimately deserve to be redeemed from exile, I'm going to have to do it, says God, Lema'an Hashem Kodeshi, for the sake of my name in the world. So you will not and cannot stay in exile permanently. You will always be in this transient state until you as a nation realize what it is you are and what you're meant to be. V'zarakti alechem amayim tehorim utahartem. I will throw upon you purifying waters and you shall become pure and you will have a lev basar you will be given a heart of flesh not a heart of stone. The Torah, the simple commandments I've asked you to keep in the land will fit like a glove. There will be a natural expression of the justice and righteousness that you will exhibit in the land when you eventually go back. Meaning that the restoration of Israel is actually in the hands of the exiled community. It is not the people that are there now that are going to restore the land. It is you. It is the people in exile. And you are going to transform yourselves and you are going to go back. It's a massive chapter. It's one of the biggest chapters in the Bible. Chapter 36 of the book of Ezekiel. And then of course chapter 37. <laughs> chapter 37, the vision, the valley of the dry bones. Listen, It's very famous. I don't need to necessarily go over it. Many, many commentators throughout the generations and when I say the generations you know the book of Ezekiel has been around for two and a half thousand years have tried to work out what this is is it a vision is it an allegory did it really happen did he actually do this there are different views of course there's a minority view in the Talmud that a minority view in the Talmud that it never actually happened that it was an allegory a minority view Although that minority view is good enough for the Rambam in Moreno Vuchim, the Rambam writes that it's an allegory. Others say, oh, no, 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 it really happened, and not only that, we're the descendants of those people, we still have their tefillin, but whether or not it happened, it's a phenomenal thing, and every generation has said that they understand this, but I think that our generation probably understands it more than any other generation. Because we have actually seen images of valleys filled with bones. We have seen people get up from graves and come to the land of Israel. We have seen the vision of what happens in the great promise made at the end of chapter 37 that after the resurrection of the people they will come to the land of Israel and their cities and towns will not contain the populations and they will overflow. We are seeing that in our generation. But there are other great corollaries that have to go with that as well, and other great responsibilities. And of course, after we're resettled in the land, chapters 38 and 39 of the book of Sefer Yechezkel, Gog and Magog, the big, the big war that's going to come. And I don't want to talk about whether or not that is applicable to our generation, but Vahamivin Yavin, those who, um, look, Gog and Magog, yeah, we have to be wary because every, so many people have, have read the world and its situation and said, oh no, Gog and Magog is our generation. But I don't think that as many generations as us have as much claim to look at the world and go, yes, that's quite a reasonable scenario. 
all the nations, Gog of Magog. And basically it's either Gog of a place called Magog or Gog representing a collection of nations called Magog. We're not entirely sure, but they all come together and combine in the biggest army that history has ever seen. And they come against the land of Israel and against the Jewish community of the land of Israel for no other reason than to plunder and to kill and cause mayhem. And they all massively converge around the land of Israel and then God comes and slaughterates them. And they die in their millions. Takes seven years to, to clean up the bodies. And their millions on the hills of Israel. Obviously there are many people today saying that that scenario is around the corner. They should not get too excited. It's not really something that's going to be easy to witness, Gog or Magog. But it happens, and it's very clear if you read the Prakim, it happens not as a prelude, it happens after we come back to the land and resettle the land as per chapter 37. And then, and I'll very quickly finish off because there's a couple of things I want to say about this, and I know I've gone over the hour. And that is that chapters 40 to 48, it's very, very symmetrical because chapters 40 to 48, so, so this is the... Uh, restoration, but specifically, 40 to 48, is Yechezkel's vision of the new temple. His vision of the new temple. Now, it's a very complex structure. It's much bigger than either of the two temples that we've seen so far, and it has a whole lot of space cleared around it, and it's a different sort of construction. The big question is, when the people of Judah, when the Judeans came back to Jerusalem under the decree of Cyrus in 538, when the Persians defeated the Babylonians and they came back in 538, and then it took them about 20 years, but eventually by around 516 they dedicated the new temple. Why did they not build Ezekiel's temple? There are many different discussions on that. Some people, some scholars have said that, some sages of Israel have said that had they built Ezekiel's temple, then it wouldn't have been destroyed. But Ezekiel's temple clearly wasn't built then, and it's clearly a much, and he actually tells you, at the end of days, it is a messianic vision of what this temple is. And there are differences about this temple, not the least of which is the fact that there are two streams of water emerging from the temple that go and increase powerfully in two different directions, one due east and one due west. One goes all the way to the Mediterranean and the other one goes all the way to the Dead Sea. Which is interesting. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Shimon Peres' famous plan for this massive canal which they call from the Med to the Dead to the Red. And they have a whole canal system they've talked about. I mean, Ezekiel tells you that that's what's going to happen. And also there are changes in the temple itself. It's no longer all the Kohanim are fit for service, only those of the members of the house of Tzadok. That could intimate to us that later on, in the, much later, in the late second temple period, the text of Ezekiel became a foundational text for the Tzadokim, for the Sadducees, who saw themselves descendants of the house of Tzadok. So it's very interesting post-history, the book of Ezekiel. The other interesting thing about those eight chapters is to do with the inheritance of the tribes. You know that when we originally conquered the land of Israel back under Joshua, back here in, I don't know, 12, 1300 BCE, the tribal allocations were sort of a bit all over the place. But Ezekiel says that, when, and of course in chapter 37, with the dry bones, he's already told us about the unity of the two sticks, one representing Judah, one representing Yosef. In other words, the restoration that's going to happen is contingent upon the unity of the Jewish people and the people of Israel coming together. But in the new allotment of tribes, it's going to be like this, horizontal stripes. Every tribe's going to get a little bit of coast, every tribe gets a bit of central country, every tribe gets a bit of the Jordan Valley, and it goes like this with, of course, Jerusalem in the centre. So it's a totally different vision. But at the very, 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 very end of the book, the end of chapter 48, this priest who started off as a young priest going into exile with Yechonyah, and through a phenomenal series of visions and experiences of which I have really only touched the headlines of. I mean, I haven't gone anywhere into the depth that the book does. The book's much more exciting than this talk. But at the very, very end, in the last Pasuk, Ezekiel tells us that Yerushalayim itself is going to get a new name. That Jerusalem will in fact be called Hashem Shama. That God is there. 
which really is the essence of what Ezekiel is saying. In chapters 8 to 10, Ezekiel witnesses this vision of the Shekhinah leaving the temple, leaving Jerusalem. But in fact, God as an energy, God as a presence, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, will return to reside amongst the people of Israel because they will have assisted humanity to create a world which can contain the presence of God. And in fact, in chapter 36, he summarizes the entire book in three words. In the sanctification of me in you to their eyes. Meaning to the nations of the world. And of course, I don't need to point out to you that is Rashi Tevot. It's an acronym of Bavel. Meaning that it is precisely from Bavel, precisely from a position of exile. Exile being this transcendent process that the Jewish people are destined to go through again and again until they reach the level that they understand that the world, Hashem, is the most repeated phrase in Yechezkel, that the world will know that I am Hashem because you have been through exile and you have been restored, but you haven't come back to create the society that got destroyed. You've come back to create a society that is a full manifestation and revelation of the divine. This is the essential message of Yechezkel. This is why Yechezkel is such an important Navi for us, in a sense, today, but why it represents this incredible pivot at this juncture of history. And, of course, it was a massive text in the restoration here when we came back to rebuild the temple. And Yechezkel, of course, thankfully, they saved it, and it is still read today. So thank you for listening to that. We got through the book. Find out more about David Solomon's books, recordings and classes, or to support his work and teachings for just a few dollars a month, visit davidsolomon.online.